16, 1 through 2 says, Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Heavenly Father, let us see that in you is life. And let us come to the realization that you are with us every step of the way. That we have no good thing that is apart from you. So focus our attention today on the graciousness of your name. And Lord, we will thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. still on mission. We are still commanded to make disciples. We are still commanded to love our neighbor. We are still commanded to give of our time. And we are commanded to give of our resources. Because we are still the body of Christ. We are called to be a light to the rest of the world. 
we are to be a city on a hill which cannot be hidden. We are to declare the hope of Jesus even in the midst of fear. Today, let us boldly stand on the power of our risen Savior and answer our calling. Friends, I want to welcome you once again to church this morning. I believe that the Lord is continuing to be the Lord of our church. I am overjoyed to be your pastor. I got to tell you that at the core of who I am, I love being the shepherd to this group of people. I believe that God has given us an incredible opportunity. I know there are many different uh, pessimistic ways of looking at this, and there's more optimistic ways of looking at all of this. I know that in my heart, I would love nothing more than to be with you right now, to be gathered in this place, to the, for this place to be full, and for us to stop having to be away from one another. But I also know this. At the heart of who I am, there is something going on with the power of the Holy Spirit even now. I believe in our midst we are seeing God speak to people that have not been spoken to for a long time. I believe God is stirring people, and I believe that the greatest revival could be in front of us. I believe that if my people who are called by my name will humble ourselves, will pray, will seek the face of God, and will turn from our wicked ways that God will continue to do amazing things through us. I want to thank you for your generosity in the ways that you are giving of, your, of the stewardship of the resources that God has already given to us. And I believe that God has amazing things once again in store for us. My prayer is that we would, we would bind together, that we would see Christ lifted up even now. Let us pray with one another. Heavenly Father, as we continue with worship this morning, I pray that in our hearts and our minds that we would know beyond any shadow of a doubt that the one that came, the one that died on a cross, and the one that rose again, the God that sent the Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us is even now in our midst, that he is guiding us, directing us, and speaking to our hearts. So, Lord, as we continue to look towards you, give us the hope of the calling that you have given to us to be the light of the world. And, Lord, we will continue to step in faith with you. In your gracious and holy name we pray. Amen. Psalm 16, 9, 11. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices my body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead nor will you let your faithful ones see decay you make known to me the path of life you will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand when you Everything changes and darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring and when you walk into the room every heart starts burning and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet in worship
darkness starts to vanish, every hopeless situation ceases to exist. small prayers but let us dig into the heart of God and let us believe that you can and you will answer prayer so let us stand in faith let us not be afraid of things that are looming out there but let us know beyond all shadow of a doubt that what is bigger than our problems is the solution that is found in our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ name we pray. Amen. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who believes in me shall never die. Last week we started a series, and what we're going to do in this series is that we're going to study the I Am statements in the Gospel of John. Now you might be wondering, what's an I Am statement? Well, in John's Gospel, Jesus gave us seven different pictures of who he was. 
He said, I am the resurrection, and I am the life, and the one who believes in me will live even though they die. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. He said, I am the bread of life. If you eat of me, you will never hunger again. He said, I am the gate, or I am the door by which you enter. He said, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. And he said, I am the vine, and you are are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can't do anything. Today, I want to look at the I am statement that's followed by one of the greatest grace-filled stories in all of Scripture. In John eight twelve, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, light is an interesting thing. When we are young, darkness scares us, and perhaps even some of the older people, darkness scares us. I can remember when I was a kid, and my mother would tell me to take out the trash, and of course, inevitably, I would not do so, and so I would wait too long, and now the sun would go down, and she would all of a sudden say, why didn't you take out the trash? The same question happens all the time from my wife these days, but back then, it was always, go take it out. And the trash can was all the way back at the back alley, and it seemed like that was a forever distance. So what I would do is I would come in and I would walk to the back alley and I would say, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy paths. And I would get to the trash can, I'd put it in and I'd go back the same way and I'd say, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy paths. Well, I claim that this I am statement is followed on the heels of one of the greatest grace-filled stories in all of Scripture. It's that story that we turn to now. John chapter 8, verse 2. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. This is a rather calm and serene atmosphere Jesus is teaching in the temple, and people are listening. But then, something happens. In John chapter 8, verse 3, it says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. Let's take a moment to look at the characters that bring this woman to stand before us. We have the teachers of the law. And we have the Pharisees. The teachers of the law now were also known as the scribes. They were the Jewish theologians. They were the experts in the Jewish law. This was their career that they built their livelihoods on. The Pharisees, on the other hand, formed a political party. They were a movement of conservative religious practice. And they were known as the separated ones. During this period, people were moving away from strict adherence to the law, but not these guys. Collectively, they were the rigid technicians of Scripture. They were zealous, and they were passionate in their pursuit of the law. Going forward in verse 3, it says, They brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group, and they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Now, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. They brought this woman in, as a trap. They didn't really care about Jesus' opinion at all. They were simply setting a trap. They presented a rather difficult question. Now, why was this question difficult in the beginning? 
It's because the law of Moses says in Deuteronomy 22, 22 through 24, if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. Now if a man happens to meet in a town a virgin pledged to be married and he sleeps with her, you shall take both of them to the gate of that town and stone them to death. The young woman, because she was in a town and did not scream for help, and the man, because he violated another man's wife, you must purge the evil from among you. Seems pretty clear, huh? Except that at the time of Jesus, Israel was under Roman occupation. And the Romans permitted significant self-rule. They let these nations do that had been conquered do what they pleased for the most part. The only thing that they didn't allow was for the nations they conquered to exercise the death penalty in capital cases. So it seemed like the perfect setup. If Jesus were to say, stone the woman, they would run to the Roman headquarters and say, the teacher is advocating that we exercise capital punishment without going through the Roman system. That way, they would get Jesus in trouble with the Romans. But on the other hand, if he were to say, don't stone her, they would run to the Jewish headquarters and they would say, this Jesus is a heretic because he denies the law of Moses. No matter how Jesus answered the question, he would be in serious trouble. Now there's a major question that I had when I was reading this text and when I was reading about this text with other scholars it's a question that most people have. If this woman was caught in adultery, where was her partner? Had he fled for his life? Had he escaped? Was this woman a victim of sexual bias? Had they simply singled out the feminine partner as the guilty party in the crime? Or is it possible that the man was someone of such importance that the religious elite didn't want to get him into trouble? Well, we don't know the answer to this question, but the question begs to be asked. These religious elites were not looking on this woman as a person at all. They were looking on her only as a thing. They were looking on her as an instrument so that they could formulate a charge against Jesus. They were using her as a man might use a tool. You see, to them, she had no name. She had no personality. She had no feelings. She was simply a pawn in their game. Now, it's always wrong, my friends, to regard people as things. It's always unchristian to regard people simply as a case. Of course. This woman was guilty. We see that. The law always reveals our guilt. Again, the law always reveals our guilt. She was caught in the act of adultery. She was caught deep in sin. She was, by all sense of the word, guilty. These men claim to stand close to God and to follow his ways. And unfortunately, they saw this position as giving them the right to condemn and also the duty to punish. They saw themselves as the moral watchdogs trained to tear the sinner to pieces. In all actuality, those closest to God should be founded on sympathy. It should be their duty to try and understand the force of the temptations which drove the sinner to the sin in the first place. And they should also seek to reclaim the wrongdoer. Was this woman guilty? Of course she was guilty. Did she deserve punishment? Of course she deserved punishment. After all, the law always reveals our guilt. But there's a sobering reality in this section. 
And it's really twofold. As Christians, we can look at the teachers of the law, and we can look at the Pharisees, and we can point fingers at those guys, and we can say how horrible they are. I mean, look at what they did to this woman. But on the other hand, the longer we are around this place, the longer we are grounded in our relationship with Jesus Christ, there can be a tendency to get comfortable and to point fingers at all of those outsiders and to talk about what they are doing and how they aren't measuring up. Ultimately, we can lose sight of the fact that until we see ourselves as sinners, we won't see our need for a Savior. Once again, until we see ourselves as sinners, we won't see our need for a Savior. The law reveals our guilt, but the good news of Jesus Christ is that God doesn't stop with the law. The second thing we realize from this story is that the love reveals God's grace. The love which is in Jesus Christ and rooted and grounded in him reveals God's grace. We see this in verse 6, but Jesus bent down and started to ride on the ground with his finger. He ignores these other men. Now a burning question for scholars throughout the ages has been this. What is Jesus right? Well, some have speculated that he simply wished to gain more time and not to be rushed into a decision. He wanted time to think and time to take it to God. Others have speculated that Jesus may well deliberately, may have well deliberately forced these men to repeat their charges so that they might possibly realize the cruelty which lay behind them. Another scholar commented this way, Jesus was seized with an intolerable sense of shame. He could not meet the eye of the crowd. He could not meet the eye of the accusers. And perhaps at that moment, least of all, he could not meet the eye of the woman. And so in his burning embarrassment and in his confusion, he stooped down so as to hide his face. And he began writing with his fingers upon the ground. Well, it may well be that the leering, lustful look on the faces of the men, the bleak cruelty in their eyes, and the curiosity of the crowd, along with the shame of the woman, all combined to twist the very heart of Jesus Christ. Both in his agony and in his pity, he hid his eyes. But the most interesting and the most widely accepted suggestion is that he himself, bowing his head, was writing with his finger on the earth to declare their sins, and they were seeing their several sins written there on the stones. The normal word to write, as we see in Greek, is graphine. But the word used here is categraphine, which means to write down a record against. At any rate, Scripture goes on in verse 7 and says, When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up. And he said to them, Let any One of you who is without sin, be the first to throw a stone at her. These men had no concept of the grace of God. It's not wrong to punish criminals for their crimes, but it is wrong, my friends, to convene a kangaroo court, to drag a person before such court, and to add insult to her injury. When Jesus said, any of you, who is without sin, the words without sin 
mean without even a ting of sin. He wasn't simply talking about their outside behaviors. He was speaking about their inside behavior, about their heart. These men have missed out on the grace of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, because they were more concerned with the letter of the law than the grace of God. Ultimately, they had lost sight of their need for a Savior because they had lost sight of themselves as sinners. Going forward, starting with verse 8, it says again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first. I find that interesting. The older ones? Could it have been that because they had been steeped in their own self-righteousness for so long, the ones that had been there for so long and a long time found that they had lost sight of their Lord and Savior a long time before. And so as the years went by, it became the gravity of their own sin became more and more. And now what was being written were the things that they didn't want to remember back in their past. Until only Jesus was left. With the woman still standing there, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And the lady says the only words that she says the whole time, no one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you. If you can't relate to those words, And I believe your heart is hardened. Because each one of us comes to God like this woman. We come guilty, we come ashamed, we come naked, and we come exposed. Some of you are watching today and you are steeped in your guilt over what you have done. Earlier in John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, a familiar verse for most of us, says this, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and His only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. We know that part. We see that part all the time and and we see signs with that part. But this next verse is so critical for us to understand. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. His grace, my friends, changes everything. You aren't what you have done. You aren't your worst moment. You aren't who they say you are. You are who Christ says you are. You are. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You do have an accuser, my friends. His name is Satan, and he will come to you and he will say, After what you have done, he can't love you. After what you have done, he can't forgive you. After what you have done, you can't make a difference in this world. After what you have done, you can't have a good marriage. After what you have done, you can't have a good job. After what you have done, your kids won't love you. It's over. It's too late. That's the accuser. But your Savior and your Lord says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Has no one condemned you? Then neither do I condemn you. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Was she guilty? Of course she was. Did she deserve punishment? Of course she did. But because of God's love, the grace was revealed. Then what? Then Jesus looked at this woman and said to her, Go now and leave 
your life of sin. He looks at her and he says, I know you've been struggling. And we can speculate that maybe it's because of her past. Maybe it's because of something that was done to her. We don't know, but Christ knew. What he doesn't say is, just do your best to not do it again. Instead, he says to this woman, what he says to us today, go now and leave your life of sin. Go now, my friends. Go now, you don't have to live in your lust. Go now, you don't have to live in your self-hatred. Go now, you don't have to live depressed. Go now, you don't have to live discouraged. Go now, you don't have to live self-medicating. Go now, you don't have to have all of the answers. Go now. Why? Because I am the light of the world and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness again but will have the light of life the law reveals our guilt the love reveals god's grace the light reveals our hope so go now and leave your life of sin. This isn't a preachy buck up buttercup moment. It isn't a do better type of thing. Here's what it is. In the grace and in the mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, not only was Jesus the light of the world, but Jesus was the light of this woman's world. When he spoke to her, she heard Jesus say these words, I'm not like those hypocritical men who only care about condemning you i care about you and i forgive your sin now go and by my power and by my light live a transformed life she was guilty she was ashamed she was humiliated it looked like her life was over then jesus covers her disgrace with his grace he levels the playing field by quietly making each man admit to their own sin and instead of condemning her and telling her to get out he forgives her he doesn't give her a license to keep on sinning he gives her a reason to stop sinning you see there is not enough darkness in this world to kick out the life in the light of Jesus Christ the accuser is silenced in the love and the grace of God no matter how dark it gets when the light of the world becomes the light of your world he will truly guide and he will direct all the pieces of your life there is one more thing that i want to point out this morning jesus looked at all of these religious people that were around who had gathered at the temple courts they were dumbfounded by the grace they were dumbfounded by the mercy of god they knew about the law they knew that it reveals our guilt, but they've just seen the love of God revealed through Jesus Christ. Now he looks at them, and along with this lady, he also says to them, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, not only is this light for the lady with sin, but this light is is for us as the church to give to the rest of the dying and lost world in front of us. Elsewhere, Jesus will say in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. You see, I want the life that the light will bring. I don't want to be a part of a group of people that sit back and point fingers at all those outside people saying how awful and sinful they are. I want to be a part of a group of people that hold on to the optimism of the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that's revealed in his love that is shown brighter than any darkness and shines forth as our hope in a seemingly dark world. Let's have confidence in the hope that we prefer Confess. Let's believe that people can truly belong, believe, and become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Today, I believe we have ones gathered with us that are feeling shame. I believe there are some that are feeling guilt. I believe that are, there are some that are feeling condemnation. 
over things that you have done in your past. Maybe there's others here that have people that have said things about them or said things to them and it weighs you down. You are not who they say you are. You are who God says you are. And if you are in Christ Jesus, there is now no condemnation. Some of you may be in a place where you just need some hope. You need a little bit of light. And a little bit of light will give an awful lot of hope. You may be in a place where you need encouragement. Where you need God's presence. Where you need God's grace. You need the light of the world to become the light of your world. Pray with me this morning. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you. We praise you because you are a part of our lives and you are in the room with us right now. Wherever we are and wherever we are gathering, you are there. God, we ask that your presence would be made known in our lives right now. We pray that the peace that passes all understanding will guard our hearts as we lean into you. We pray that whatever it is that is holding on to us, that we would go now and that we would leave those things behind and that we would go after the heart of God. We would believe that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And we would hold on to the hope that we profess. That we would believe above and beyond everything that your grace and your mercy are changing us even now. As we continue in the attitude of prayer today, I believe there are those of you who wonder where you stand with God. You've tried to do a lot of things, but you wonder if you measure up. The ultimate problem is that you are a sinner. That you're trying to live your life in a right way all on your own. But that, my friends, is impossible. Why? Because you can't ever please God. Because you can't ever measure up. Because you can't ever exert enough effort. Because you have missed the entire gospel and the good news of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus is the light of the world. Whoever follows him should never walk in darkness. Being a Christian isn't just about going to church. It's about becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe you don't think that you're good enough to follow him. The truth is, none of us are. Because of his grace, because of his love, Jesus became sin for us on the cross. And he died and he rose again. So that whoever calls on his name will be forgiven. And all of your sins will be washed away. And you will become brand new. That's the very reason that you are with us today. It is your time call on Jesus. I would love for everybody to pray aloud after me this morning. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new. Jesus, I believe you died for me. You rose again so I could live for you. You are my light. I will follow you. Help me to never walk in darkness ever again. Thank you for new life. I give you mine. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Friends, I want to welcome you to the body of Christ. The body of Christ that desires to follow the light of the world. 
one step at a time based on the grace and the mercy that God pours out we can follow him I would love for you to reach out to me if you make a decision today you would reach out to me through Facebook my name is Jonathan Hall once again I would love nothing more than to walk beside you as you continue to take steps towards our loving Lord he wants to guide you and he wants to direct you now we're gonna sing a song together with one another that claims that we are no longer slaves to fear but we are children of God let us believe that and let us hold on to that hope that we profess may God bless you
split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. Yes, I am. I am a child of I love the words of that song. In that song, it says, You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so that I could stand and sing, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I am a child of God. Friends, at this time, there is much fear to be had. There are certain occupations, I believe, that have felt that fear a little bit more. One of those is our healthcare professions here in this community. And one of the things that I would like to do is we have purchased thank you cards to give out to the people that are in our healthcare professions. And uh, what I would like you to know is we're going to have two mailboxes where our mailbox is usually, which is uh, right on the other side, the, uh, the west side of our gym. And we'll have one that uh, says return, and we'll have another one that will have cards in it. We would love for you to come by. We know you're not supposed to completely get out, but we're giving you an excuse if you live around this area to get out and to come where nobody else is going to be, to grab several of those cards and to just write a thank you note. In my thank you note, I, I, I wrote uh, the verses, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which I stated in my, in my message. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean out on your own understanding and all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. I wrote that in there, and then I just simply wrote another couple of lines about we thank you and we want you to know that you're highly appreciated at this time and that we're praying for you. And then also just said basically that our heart is for them to understand that they are appreciated at these times. So you can write that in however way you want to, and then you'll just return those cards in there, and then we will write their names on the outside so that they're personalized to the actual people. Our hope and our desire at these times is once again to be a church where people belong, believe, and become fully devoted followers of Christ. We believe that this is just a beginning of what we're going to do in this season and the way in which we're going to carry out the mission of God in belonging and believing and becoming. We will be looking at uh, doing this for other entities here in our community, but the first one that we wanted to do was for the health care, and we would love for you to be a part of that. If you have any questions, you can get a hold of me on Facebook or through our email, um, or you can get a hold of Stacy, and Stacy will get a hold of me, and we'll get you the information, but we would love for you to be a part of this. As we watch this next video, let us think about how God wants to walk out and make us a city on a hill that cannot not be hidden because our lives as a church is under the lordship of Jesus Christ and the light of the world is illuminating the lives around us and around this area. May God bless you.